Um, today, um, I, it's my pleasure to present our seminar speaker, the first speaker of this series this semester. His name is Dr. Brian Bingham, and she, he comes from the Channel Point Learning Center at Western Washington University. And I had the pleasure of meeting um, Dr. Bingham back in 2001 when I participated in an undergrad research uh, program geared towards recruiting and training minorities in my own science. And I just learned this morning that he was actually um, hired straight out of his PhD to develop this program for minorities. And he knew nothing <laughs> about still this type of position. He didn't speak Spanish. <laughs> He's working on it still. <laughs> And I was surprised because it was an amazing experience for me. And actually, uh, several of our CMS students are alumni from this program called MinSoup. So it's an amazing program. And they actually won, in 2002, the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Math, Engin and Engineering Mentoring. So it is an excellent program, and he's done an amazing job. And he's been the director of the program for 24 years. So this morning, our students from professional development had the pleasure of meeting him and having interesting discussions about career choices and things like that. Um, Brian received his, both his bachelor's and master's degrees in zoology at the Brigham Young University in Utah. And then he went on to conduct his PhD in biology at Florida State University. So he was down here for a while. Um, after finishing his PhD, he joined the Channel Point Marine Center at Western Washington University, and he's been a professor th th um, there since 1990. Um, he's also been a co-director of the Marine and Estuarine Science Graduate Program at the university for 16 years. <laughs> um, and I think besides you know, the professorship commitments and things like that, he's, he's shown a great commitment to education and he has grants to secure um, equipment for the center. He is very involved with the community. He's conducted biological service um, in the local area and also um, found funding to support beach cleanup efforts in his community, which I think it's really cool. And also, when they started the MIMSU program, this undergrad undergraduate research program, they only had funding for three years to see if it would work out since they didn't have any experience with this. And it turned out they got funding for 25 years. So he's been successful at getting funding for 25 years. So I think that's very impressive. <laughs> and in terms of research, he's interested in marine ecology with an emphasis on processes which structure marine benthic communities. And during the past few years, his lab has been focusing on very understanding how environmental stressors affect algal nidarian um, symbiosis. And today, you get to hear a little bit about that type of research. So, welcome, Dr. Bingham. <laughs> thank you, Karina. Well, thank you very much. It's just a pleasure to be here. Uh, get off the plane, and you can feel the air when you breathe it again. And it's wonderful <laughs> to to be here and experience it after Washington for 25 years. So uh, I'm excited to share with you some of the work we've been doing and uh, some of the questions that we strive to answer in the, the lab that I'm participating in. And today I want to talk to you about this animal. This whole seminar will focus on a single organism. This is Anthopleura elegantissima, which is the single most abundant anemone, intertidal anemone on the west coast of North America. It ranges all the way from Alaska down through Baja and it's a very important part of the communities it occurs in. Uh, both numerically, you can get up more than 500 per square meter of these things, so they'll dominate some fairly extensive areas of the intertidal. But also productivity-wise, they're very important. And the productivity of a mass like this can actually rival the macroalgae in what they're actually producing and moving as carbon through the environment. So what they're doing in these communities, how they interact, the ecology of this species can be pretty important to how these systems function. And uh, one of the primary, excuse me, okay. One of the primary uh, features that makes this so interesting is the symbiotic relationship that it has. And as corals, it can be symbiotic with dinoflagellates and it's a different species than the corals have. Symbiodinium muscatinii is the one in our area and um, it takes them up as corals, it holds them as corals. But the, the really intriguing thing is it's also symbiotic with a green chlorophyte. And so we've essentially got two phyla of algae, if you will, that are symbiotic in the same organism. Elliptochlorus is normally found in lichens, so it's just a very different kind of animal to be living in the tissues of one of these cnidarians. And as a result of, of that, you get some very intriguing morphs of Anthopleura. And these all came from the same habitat, just in different 
subclimates of the, the intertidal. And you can find them where they're entirely symbiotic with the symbiodinium, same one as in corals, and they look brown. Uh, you can get them totally green where they're symbiotic with elliptochlorus. You can get these mixtures of any sort from 1% to 5%, 50% of the balance of these two in the same individual. And then they'll also live completely asymbiotic. And I'll probably interchangeably use aposymbiotic and asymbiotic. There's some debate about which is the better term. Uh, but uh, they can live heterotrophically, so they get their food just by capturing things in the benthic environment. So the, the net result of this is we have a very tract tractable envir uh, environmental experimental system where we can take different combinations of these symbiotic states and see what it does and see how it functions. One of the very basic questions of coral symbiosis is how these interplay, how these partners interact with one another. And it's a very complex, difficult thing to, to extract. So we have a system where, uh, in an anemone at least, we can maybe look at some of these things. There's another feature that makes this really interesting, and that is that these two symbionts are very different in their quality as a partner. Uh, the symbiodinium tends to like high light and high temperatures. It does better at those kinds of environments. And the elliptochlorus, in contrast, you're going to find in more low light and cooler temperatures. And the photosynthetic rates differ quite a bit. So the symbiodinium's usually cranking on the photosynthesis at a higher rate, so they're producing more carbon that's being transferred to the, the host. And the net result is that the symbiodinium are thought to be pretty good um, partners that may have a fairly important benefit for the uh, anemone. In contrast, the elliptochlorus don't photosynthesize very quickly year-round. And so the idea is that potentially the transfer and the benefit is lower for the green anemones. As a result of these differential uh, tolerances for heat and light, you get some really intriguing patterns in the um, anemones and their symbiotic state geographically and within intertidal zones. So if we're to look at the populations of Anthopleura along the entire coast, down here in central California, you start to pick up anemones that have green symbionts, that have the elliptochlorus. And there's an area where they overlap where you'll find individuals with both. As you go north, you tend to transfer more to entirely elliptochlorus. I have this open here because nobody's actually done systematic surveys here, but we know up in Alaska they're all totally elliptochlorus, and we've, what we have seen up here tends to say that they're probably all elliptochlorus also. The symbiodinium down south, they're dominant, and it's warmer down here, it makes sense. It's cooler up here, it makes sense. And so on these big geographic scales, we get these zonations, if you will, of distributions of these animals. But you can also get it in very discrete intertidal areas. So if you go to an area with high sunlight, you're probably going to find the uh, symbiodinium. You might have transitional phases where you have mixtures and then down to the elliptochlorus where it's cooler. And in dark habitats, under rocks, in caves, you tend to get them without the symbionts. So in a fairly restricted area, you can get all three symbiotic conditions of uh, these animals. So one of the questions that, that comes to mind as you think about this, if you, as you think about corals, they're very sensitive to, to change in temperature. Even a one degree increase in temperature can cause some pretty fundamental changes in the, the condition and the health of the symbiosis. Here we have a, a temperate environment where we get fairly major shifts in temperature, not only seasonally, but also even on individual tidal cycles. You can get some major impacts on these intertidal animals. And it raises a question, how stable are these? And as corals, do they shift back and forth? So as temperatures goes up, go up, are you going to see a shift toward brown? As it drops, do you shift back to green? How are these animals and these algae responding to one another and these dinoflagellates? And what are the consequences of those things? So that's, those are the kinds of questions we spend a lot of time worrying about. And so I'd like to describe just three uh, kinds of experiments we've done to try and get at these questions and try and better understand this particular symbiotic situation. The work that I'm going to describe first was done on San Juan Island, uh, the Friday Harbor Labs of University of Washington's right here. If any of you have been out here, this is where you get the ferries to go to Canada, so we're right on the edge there. And down at the far south tip, there's a really nice area here called Cattle Point that historically has gotten a lot of attention from researchers at Friday Harbor. And in the 1970s, Len Muscatine and some of his students 
went down there and were looking at the, the anemones in that area, and he did a pretty thorough census of the Anthopleura on this particular rocky bench. And his conclusion was that those animals were largely green. And so we have, it's, it wasn't quantitative in a sense, but it gave us a baseline that we could say, okay, we know this has been examined at least once. Let's go out and let's see what those environments look like, what the anemones look like, and let's take that as our next baseline that we can continue to track in the future and just see what's happening to the populations on this site. So this is a look at the site, and these represent three, quadra or three transects that we put out there. And then we'd go back uh, quarterly and just randomly sample the anemones along these areas to just get a picture of what is the symbiotic state of Anthopleura elegantissima at this particular site and get a, get, a, get a solid data point. And we're a largely undergraduate master's degree institution, so we use lots of undergraduates. You recruit them in the summer when the field work looks like that, and then you hang on to them to the winter. Our, <laughs> our low tides are in the middle of the night, and so you can't access these things until the middle of the night when it's cold and rainy and, and miserable, but it, it's always been just delightful out there with them. This is a wonderful, wonderful system, and I, I really respect coral researchers who are looking at different clades and all the effort you have to go to to distinguish different clades of symbiodinium. We, this is a single tentacle just squashed on a slide, and you can tell the two symbionts apart just readily. The um, elliptochloris are smaller, they're rounder, they're green, um, and the symbiodinium much larger and a little more irregular. One other thing you might get an idea of just looking at this picture is that these two symbionts are different in their growth rates. And you can see more doubling or more cleavage or more division going on in the greens than the browns. And that's a general pattern. They tend to grow about twice as fast, we think, as the browns. So another fundamental difference in these two symbionts. So we could take these animals. You could just take a tentacle clip or you can grind them up. You can take samples and you can actually quantify what's going on symbiotically with, with individual anemones. We also put out temperature loggers to try and get an idea of what's going on in the environment, what the habitat's doing, what these animals are experiencing. And I'll just step through this. This is the months of the year we sampled. These yellow points are the sample dates. And then we had these loggers out there continuously. And see here, we get some really profound differences in light intensity over the year. Uh, during the summer, it can actually be pretty nice out there. Little uh, light cover, long days, 16, 17 hour days. We're right here in October, it's starting to get miserable and people start to have seasonal affective order, disorder and all kinds of things because it's so dark for so long. But you think about a photosynthetic organism in the winter in this area seeing something very, very different than they do in the summertime. So just based on light alone, there's some really interesting variability. Now if we look at um, the duration of exposure of an anemone in this situation, you can see that sometimes they can be out of water up almost half the day, 11, 12 hours, they're experiencing exposed conditions. And these daytime immersions happen in the middle of the day, the hottest part of the day. And so during the summer, these animals that are symbiotic are exposed to sunlight and to high temperatures during the worst part of the day, if you were to think about conditions for the symbiont. In the winter, the coolest temperatures are at night when they're exposed. And so they can see some pretty major fluctuations in temperature as a function of seasonal patterns. And some pretty major effects based on tidal height. Uh, you can see here uh, up at the higher reaches, you know, we're reaching 25, 28 degrees that these things are seeing. And that may not be high around here, but it's certainly high over there. And down lower, uh, much more moderate conditions. But the bottom line is there's a very strong seasonal effect and seasonal pattern in what's happening in their environment and what these animals are doing. And you think about trying to hang on to those symbionts and avoid bleaching and to try and function in that situation and production of reactive oxygen species by the symbionts. There's all kinds of things that probably go on during these periods of, of exposure and they change with time that they're out there. And so first question was simply, okay, we know that these, these features change. How does that impact what the symbionts themselves are doing? And so we can go in there and we can measure growth rates of the symbionts based on division rates. So you take a, a static snapshot, see how many are dividing, and use that as a mitotic index. And so here are our various months of sampling, our three tidal heights. These represent the number of anemones we sampled. And the general pattern, if you look there, is that these things are growing much more in July and November than they are in February and April. 
uh, the conditions are more favorable for the algal growth, uh, much more going on here. And these bars indicate differences in seasons, so we see differences here versus here and here. And um, one thing you'll notice is the scales are very different here. These Elliptochloris marin are much more, much faster growers, and that shows up in the data. The th real striking thing to me is that these mirror one another almost exactly. And so even though this one's much less tolerant of high temperature and high light, it's keeping pace pretty well with what the, the symbiodinium are doing. So uh, a little surprising. We expected much greater differences in these two. Um, but they appeared, at least on the surface, for whatever the environment's doing, they're both responding in the same way with their growth rates. Uh, I don't know why that is. don't know how those elliptochloris are keeping up, but that's what the, the data look like. Now, if we ask the question... Okay, we know these are, sh are shifting in growth rates. Is that causing a shift in the relative abundance of the two symbionts? And the prediction would be that as you go into the summer and it gets really hot and high light, that we ought to see driving down of the elliptochloris. That they just don't like high light, they ought to go down. We ought to see symbiodinium go up. And essentially, if we, you just look at this bar here, these again are the months and the, the three tidal heights. Just look at this bar on the lower tidal level of the symbiodinium, and it's remarkably consistent. You know, and there might be some little bit going here. This peak's certainly higher in the elliptochloris, but there's no statistically significant effect here that it looks like despite these radical changes in environmental conditions, these things are just marching through and going through these cycles and staying where they are. They're not shifting the way corals apparently do or shuffling. And um, that, again, was a surprise that somehow these animals and these symbionts are, are adapted to the point that they can avoid some fairly dramatic shifts over these annual seasonal cycles. And so the data showed us that this is actually a, quite a stable system, much more stable than we would have thought. And so why? What is it about this system that makes it so stable? And if we look at density, first of all, and the fact that the densities don't change, there's a couple of potential reasons that is. First one is that it we think that these anemones control the density of the, the algae in their tissues. And if they start to grow really fast, they essentially mow the lawn by spitting them out. And so they'll get enough that it starts to be a burden and they'll just, you'll get these boluses of cells being ejected from the, the mouths. And that apparently is enough to maybe keep those levels down and keep them at a, a level they want. We've tried to see if they can selectively choose greens or browns to spit out. We haven't been able to, dis to demonstrate that, but I think it's, there might be something there, that they may have to spit out more greens than they do browns. Uh, don't know that, but it's, it's an interesting question to, to ponder. Um, and then the other possibility is that the growth rates of these two are just coupled. These cells live inside the gastrodermal tissues of the anemone, so they're right inside the gastrodermis. And during the winter, the anemones actually shrink. And so they get smaller, the growth rates drop, they may just be going like that and keeping pace at a density that's, that's effective and is good for these two partners in this very tightly linked symbiosis to coexist. Um, so some intriguing things, I think, that are going on here. Why doesn't the percent composition change? Well, as you sit and think about this, this environment we live in, if that symbiosis changed to every environmental modification, they'd be changing constantly. Uh, during a single tidal cycle, our water's 10 degrees, 12 degrees. So they could go from, you know, full sunlight, full summer, nice 25 degrees, and then within seconds as the tide comes up, they've shot down to 10. Tide goes back down, they're out at high temperatures. They couldn't respond maybe that quickly, and so they've, maybe they've just got a, some ability to tolerate those changes on the short term to avoid these, these constant fluctuations of conditions that would be... Um, just maladaptive, I think, to try and do that over the longer term of what's going on. And so I think that's probably the reason this particular situation is so stable relative to maybe a coral that lives in, a, lives in an environment that doesn't change very much. Uh, temperatures are pretty stable. Uh, lights tend to be fairly consistent. And if you disrupt those, the corals have problems with the symbiosis. These, you can push them pretty hard and it doesn't seem to change the symbiosis. But what about longer time scales, and what, what could happen under these kinds of conditions? We looked at one year and saw, yeah, they're, they're fairly stable. But what we know is that the waters are warming. This is from a, a station just north of us. 
and we know that there's these long decadal and century long whatever changes in air and seawater temperature and the question is against that background what's happening to these symbioses and the way to to think about that is to to maybe look at the muscatine paper that showed in the 70s essentially these were green symbioses they're dominated by elliptochlorus what i have here now is all of those anemones sorted by or, or shown by what percentage of the symbionts were brown and so if this is a muscatine data we have everything would have been down here in some lower area of this because everything was predominantly green what we've seen in this local population is a shift toward brown the upper tidal levels they're essentially almost entirely brown and even at the very low tidal levels they're at least 50 percent brown so what we're seeing is browning of the populations um, Anthopleura was historically it appears to be fairly green now we're seeing a shift to populations that are brown that's interesting uh, it's it we had anticipated maybe this would be a good barometer for a changing climate and these would still be mostly green well they're already brown but um, over time I'd expect them to continue to go more and more and more brown and less and less green and maybe moving further and further north as a, a refuge perhaps for the green symbiont to still be in these things but that's what's going on and that's what the the pattern is and that leads to the question of okay we know they're browning we see that in the data we know they can coexist with either we think that browns are a better symbiont but what are the consequences of a total shift from a green symbiosis to a brown symbiosis you know are they the same thing is is one of these green ones the same thing essentially as a brown or is there something fundamentally different in the way this functions and the consequences for the animal and um, it turns out that there are some really interesting things that are happening so this is a just a little chunk of rock off the coast out here that turns out to be a really good place to collect anemones because nobody can get to it and um, it's also nice because in a very very limited area you can get all three of these morphs in very high numbers so down in this crack this side of the cracks totally green this side's totally brown and then just over here under this rock they're all a symbiotic and so with an area of you know a couple of meters you can get high numbers of these and that's really important because you want these to be feeding at about the same rates to have the same source of benthic food you want the history of, of the temperatures to be very similar and so the idea was by collecting animals from these three areas we could just do a simple comparison and say how do they look